the discourse on the 8th and 9th. Introduction to the Ceremony My father, yesterday you promised me you would take my mind to the 8th stage, and after that you would take me to the ninth. You said, this is the sequence of the tradition. Yes, my child, this is the sequence, but the promise was made about human nature. I told you this when I initiated the promise, and I set it on the condition that you will remember each of the stages. After I received the spirit through the power, I established the action for you. Clearly, understanding resides in you. In me, it is as if the power were pregnant. For when I conceived from the spring that flows to me, I gave birth. Father, you have spoken every word rightly to me, but I am amazed at what you say. You say, the power in me. He said, I gave birth to the power as children are born. Then, Father, I have many siblings if I am to be counted among the generations. Right, my child. This good thing is counted, always. So, my child, you must know your siblings and honor them rightly and well, since they have come from the same Father. I have addressed each of the generations. I have named them, since they are offspring like these children. Then, Father, do they also have mothers? My child, they are spiritual, for they exist as forces nurturing other souls. That is why I say they are immortal. Your word is true, and from now on it cannot be refuted. Father, begin the discourse on the eighth and ninth, and count me also with my siblings. Let us pray, my child, to the Father of the All, with your siblings, who are my children, that he may grant the Spirit, and I may speak. How do they pray, Father, when they are united with the generations? Father, I want to obey. This is not from necessity or law, rather, one rests in her, and she loves him, and loving makes you remember the progress you have experienced as wisdom from the books. My child, think of your early years of life. Like a little child, you have raised senseless and foolish questions. Father, I have experienced progress and foreknowledge from the books, and they are greater than what is lacking. These matters are my first concern. My child, when you understand the truth of your statement, you will find your siblings, who are my children, praying with you. Father, I understand nothing else than the beauty I have experienced in the books. This is what you call the beauty of the soul, the edification you have experienced in stages. May understanding come to you, and you will become wise. Father, I have understood each of the books, and especially that is in my child, in praises from those who raised them. Father, I shall receive from you the power of the discourse you will utter. As it was spoken to the two of us, Father, let us pray. My child, it is fitting for us to pray to God with all our mind and all our heart and our soul, and to ask Him that the gift of the Eighth reach us, and that each receive from Him what belongs to Him. Your job is to understand. Mine is to be able to utter the discourse from the spring that flows to me. Prayer for the Ascent to the Eighth and Ninth let us pray, Father. I call upon you, who rules over the kingdom of power, whose word 
is an offspring of light, whose words are immortal, eternal, immutable, whose will produces life for forms everywhere, whose nature gives form to substance, by whom souls, powers, and angels are moved, whose word reaches all who exist, whose forethought reaches everyone in that place, who produces everyone, who has divided the eternal realm among spirits, who has created everything, who, being self within self, supports everything, being perfect, the invisible God to whom one speaks in silence, whose image is moved when it is managed, and it is so managed, mighty one in power, who is exalted above majesty, who is superior to those honored. Lord, grant us wisdom from your power that reaches us, that we may relate to ourselves the vision of the eighth and ninth. Already we have advanced to the seventh, since we are faithful and abide in your law. Your will we fulfill always. We have walked in your way and have renounced evil, so the vision may come. Lord, grant us truth in the image. Grant that through spirit we may see the form of the image that lacks nothing, and accept the reflection of the fullness from us through our praise. Recognize the spirit within us. From you, the universe received soul. From you, one unbegotten, the begotten one came to be. The birth of the self-begotten is through you, the birth of all begotten things that exist. Accept these spiritual offerings from us, which we direct to you. With all our heart, soul, and strength, save what is within us, and grant us immortal wisdom. Vision of the Eighth and Ninth My child, let us embrace in love. Be happy about this. Already from this, the power that is light is coming to us. I see, I see ineffable depths. How shall I tell you, my child? We now have begun to see the places. How shall I tell you about the all? I am mind, and I see another mind, one that moves the soul. I see the one that moves me from pure forgetfulness. You give me power. I see myself. I wish to speak. Fear seizes me. I have found the beginning of the power above all powers, without beginning. I see a spring bubbling with life. I have said, my child, that I am mind. I have seen. Language cannot reveal this. For all of the eighth, my child, and the souls in it, and the angels, sing a hymn in silence. I, mind, understand. How does one sing a hymn through silence? Can no one communicate with you? I am silent, Father. I want to sing a hymn to you while I am silent. Then sing it. I am mind. I understand mind, Hermes, which cannot be explained because it stays in itself. I am happy, Father, to see you smiling. The universe is happy. No creature will lack your life, for you are Lord of the inhabitants everywhere. Your forethought keeps watch. I call you, Father, Aeon of Aeons, Spirit, Divine Being, who through spirit sends moisture on everyone. What do you tell me, Father Hermes? My child, I say nothing about this. It is right before God for us to remain silent about what is hidden. Trismegistus, do not let my soul be deprived of the vision. 
O Divine Being, everything is possible for you as Master of the Universe. Sing again, my child, and sing while you are silent. Ask what you want in silence. When he finished praising, he called out, Father Trismegistus, what shall I say? We have received this light, and I myself see the same vision in you. I see the eighth and the souls in it, and the angels singing a hymn to the ninth and its powers. I see the one with the power of them all, creating those in the spirit. From now on, it is good for us to remain silent with head bowed. From now on, do not speak about the vision. It is fitting to sing a hymn to the Father until the day we leave the body. What you sing, Father, I also want to sing. I am singing a hymn in myself. While you rest, sing praise. You have found what you seek. But is it right, Father, for me to sing praise when my heart is filled? What is right is for you to sing praise to God so it may be written in this imperishable book. I shall offer up the praise in my heart as I invoke the end of the universe and the beginning of the beginning, the goal of the human quest, the immortal discovery, the producer of light and truth, the sower of reason, the love of immortal life. No hidden word can speak of you, Lord. My mind wants to sing a hymn to you every day. I am the instrument of your spirit. Mind is your plectrum, and your guidance makes music with me. I see myself. I have received power from you, for your love has reached us. Right, my child. O oh, Grace, after this, I thank you by singing a hymn to you. You gave me life when you made me wise. I praise you. I invoke your name hidden in me. You exist with spirit. I sing to you with godliness. Instructions for the Preservation of the Text My child, copy this book for the temple at Diospolis in hieroglyphic characters and call it The Eighth Reveals the Ninth. I shall do it, Father, as you command. My child, copy the contents of the book on turquoise steels. My child, it is fitting to copy this book on turquoise steels and hieroglyphic characters, for mind itself has become the supervisor of these things. So I command that this discourse be carved in stone, and that you put it in my sanctuary. Eight guards watch over it with nine of the sun. The males on the right have faces of frogs. The females on the left have faces of cats. Put a square milkstone at the base of the turquoise tablets and copy the name on the azure stone tablet in hieroglyphic characters. My child, you must do this when I am in Virgo and the sun is in the first half of the day, and fifteen degrees have passed by me. Father, all you say I shall gladly do. Copy an oath in the book, so that those who read the book may not use the wording for evil purposes or try to subvert fate. Rather, they should submit to the law of God, and not transgress at all, but in purity ask God for wisdom and knowledge. And whoever is not begotten beforehand by God develops through the general and instructional discourses. Such a person will not be able to read what is written in this book, even though the person's conscience is pure within and the person does nothing shameful and does not go along with it. Such a person progresses by stages and advances in the way of immortality, and so advances in the understanding of the eighth that reveals the ninth. I shall do it, Father. This is the oath. I adjure you who will read this holy book by heaven and earth and fire and water and seven rulers of substance and the creative spirit in them and the unbegotten God 
and the self-begotten and the begotten, that you guard what Hermes has communicated. God will be at one with those who keep the oath and every one we have named, but the wrath of each of them will come upon those who violate the oath. This is the perfect one who is my child. The Prayer of Thanksgiving This is the prayer they offered. We thank you. Every soul and heart reaches out to you. O name free of trouble, honored with the designation God, praised with the designation Father. To all and all things come fatherly kindness and affection and love. And if there is sweet and simple instruction, it grants us mind, word, and knowledge. Mind that we may understand you, word that we may interpret you, knowledge that we may know you. We are happy, enlightened by your knowledge. We are happy you have taught us about yourself. We are happy while we were in the body. You have made us divine through your knowledge. The thanksgiving of one approaching you is this alone, that we know you, we have known you, light of mind, life of life, we have known you, womb of every creature, we have known you, womb pregnant with the Father's nature, we have known you, eternal constancy of the Father who conceives, so have we worshipped your goodness. One favor we ask, we wish to be sustained in knowledge, one protection we desire, that we not stumble in this life. When they prayed and said these things, they embraced and went to eat their sacred, bloodless food. Copyists note, I have copied this one of his discourses. A great many have come into my hands, but I have not copied them because I thought they were already in your possession. I even hesitate to copy these things for you, since perhaps you may already have received them, and the matter may annoy you, for that person's discourses that have come into my hands are many. Excerpt from the Perfect Discourse The Nature of the Mystery if you wish to see the nature of this mystery, consider the marvelous image of sexual intercourse between male and female. For when the male reaches his climax, the semen is ejaculated. At that moment, the female receives the strength of the male, and the male receives the strength of the female, as the semen does this. Therefore, the mystery of intercourse is performed in secret, so that the two genders may not be embarrassed in front of many who have not tried it each of them contributes to procreation. But if intercourse takes place in the presence of those who do not understand it, it is laughable and unbelievable. Moreover, these are holy mysteries of both words and deeds, because they are neither heard nor seen. Knowledge leads to learning. For this reason, such ignorant people are blasphemers. They are godless, impious. There are not many people who are different from this, and godly people are few in number. That is why there is wickedness among the masses, since learning about what is right is nowhere to be found among them. Knowledge of what is right is truly healing for the passions of material existence, and learning comes from knowledge. But if there is ignorance and no learning in the soul of a person, the incurable passions persist in that soul, and more evil comes with the passions in the form of an incurable sore, and the sore gnaws at the soul, so that the soul produces worms from the evil sore and it stinks. God does not cause these things, since God has sent knowledge and learning to people. Knowledge and Learning Among Gods and People Trismegistus, has God sent knowledge and learning to people alone? Yes, Asclepius, 
God has sent these things to people alone. We should tell you why God has granted knowledge and learning to people alone as a share of his goodness. Listen, God, the Father and Lord, created humanity after the gods, and he took humanity from the material realm, since God has given matter a place equal to spirit in creation. There are passions in it, and they flow over a person's body. Such a living thing can only exist if it eats this food, for it is mortal. It is also inevitable that inappropriate desires, which cause harm, come to be within such a person. Now the gods have come into being out of pure matter, and do not need learning and knowledge, for the immortality of the gods is learning and knowledge, since they have come out of pure matter. Immortality serves as their knowledge and learning. Of necessity, God has determined a place for humanity and established humanity in learning and knowledge. God has perfected learning and knowledge, as we have been discussing, so that by means of learning and knowledge, he might restrain passions and vices by his will. God has brought human mortality into immortality, and humanity has become good and immortal, as I have said. So God has created a twofold nature in humanity, mortal and immortal. People Surpass Gods It turned out this way because of the will of God that people should be better than the gods, since the gods are immortal, but only people are both immortal and mortal. People are related to the gods, and they know about each other with certainty. The gods know the concerns of people, and people know the concerns of the gods. Asclepius, I am talking about people who have attained learning and knowledge. About people who lack these things, we should not say anything bad, since we are divine and we are going into sacred subjects. Since we have begun the discussion of the communion between gods and people, Asclepius, understand what people can do. For just as the Father, the Lord of the universe, creates gods, so too people, mortal, earthly, living things who are not like God, create gods. People give and receive power. People become divine and create gods. Are you surprised, Asclepius? Are you, too, an unbeliever like so many? Trismegistus, I agree with what has been said to me, and I believe you when you speak, but I am astonished by this discourse. I conclude that people are blessed because they have enjoyed this great power. Images and Their Capabilities Asclepius what is greater than all this is worthy of wonder. It is obvious to us, and we agree with everyone, that the generation of the gods has come into being out of pure matter, and they are endowed only with heads. But what people fashion is only an image of the gods. They are from the lowest part of matter, and what they fashion is from the external part of the image of people. People fashion not only heads for the gods, but also all the other body parts in their own image. As God has wished that the inner person be created to be like God, so also earthly people create gods in their own image. Trismegistus, you are not talking about idols, are you? Asclepius, you are the one talking about idols. You see, Asclepius, that again you do not believe this discourse. You talk about things that have soul and breath and great accomplishments, and you call them idols. You talk about things that foretell the future and make people sick and cure them and send plagues as well, and you call them idols. The Apocalypse Egypt Will Be Despised Asclepius, don't you know that Egypt is the image of heaven, moreover that it is the dwelling place of heaven and all the forces in heaven? To tell the truth, our land is the temple of the world, but you should know that a time will come when it will seem that Egyptians have served the divine in vain 
and all their holy worship will be despised. All that is divine will depart from Egypt and fly up to heaven. Egypt will be widowed, abandoned by the gods. Foreigners will come into Egypt and rule it. Egypt or Egyptians will be prohibited from worshiping God, and whoever among them is found worshiping and serving God will face the most severe punishment. In that day, the country that was more godly than any other country will become impious. It will not be full of temples, but of tombs, not of gods, but of corpses. You, O Egypt, Egypt will be the stuff of fables, and no one will believe your divine practices. Neither the marvelous deeds, nor the holy words, not even of your wondrous words are written on stones. Barbarians will surpass you, O Egyptian, in godliness, whether they are Scythians or Hindus or others like them. Egyptians will perish. What do I have to say about the Egyptians? They will not leave Egypt. But when the gods have left the land of Egypt and have flown up to heaven, all the Egyptians will die, and Egypt will be deserted by the gods and the Egyptians. For you, O river, the day will come when you will flow more with blood than with water. Dead bodies will be piled higher than the dams, and the dead will not be mourned as much as the living. Once again the living will be recognized as Egyptians by their language. Asclepius, why are you weeping? They will seem like foreigners in terms of their customs, and divine Egypt will suffer even worse evils than these. Egypt, lover of God, dwelling place of the gods, school of religion, will become the picture of impiety. The world will be desolate. On that day the world will no longer be admired because of its wickedness and godlessness, nor will it be revered. About it we cannot say that it is either good or beautiful as something that exists now or as something that is envisioned, but it runs the risk of becoming a burden to all people. So the world will be despised, the beautiful world of God, an incomparable work, virtue in action, a vision of many forms, an abundance that does not hold back, full of every vision. People will prefer darkness to light and death to life. No one will gaze up at heaven. The godly will be considered mad, and the impious will be honored as wise, the coward will be considered strong, and the good person will be punished as a criminal. Concerning the soul and the things of the soul, and whatever has to do with immortality, along with the rest of what I have explained to you, Tat, Asclepius, and Ammon, these things will not only be considered ridiculous, they will also be regarded as being nothing. Believe me, People like this will expose themselves to the ultimate danger to their souls. A new law will be established, and the good spirits will depart, but the wicked angels will remain among people and be with them, and lead them recklessly into what is evil and into godlessness, war, and pillage, by teaching them things contrary to nature. In those days the earth will be unstable and people will not sail the sea or discern the stars in heaven. Every sacred voice of the word of God will become silent, and the air will be unhealthy. This is the senility of the world, godlessness, dishonor, contempt for noble words. End of the Apocalypse. God restores the universe. Asclepius, when all this has happened, and the Lord, the Father, and God and Creator from the first and only Deity, has seen what has happened. He formulates his plan, a good plan, against the chaos. He eradicates error and eliminates evil, sometimes drowning it in a flood, at other times burning it in a conflagration, and at still other times subduing it in wars and plagues until he brings of this work. This is the birth of the world, 
the restoration of the nature of the pious, and the good will take place in a period of time without a beginning, for the will of God has no beginning, even as his nature, which is his will, has no beginning. God's nature is will, and his will is the good. The world is good. Trismegistus, does intention correspond to will? Yes, Asclepius, since will is included in deliberation, God does not will what he has from some deficiency. Rather, since God is filled everywhere, he wills what he fully has. God has everything good, and what he wills, he wills, and he has the good he wills. God has everything, and God wills what he wills, and the good world is an image of the good. Trismegistus, is the world good? Yes, Asclepius, it is good, and I shall teach you. For just as God bestows spirit, soul, and life, the world produces what is good from matter. The changes in climate, the growth and ripening of fruit, and the like. So God rules over the heights of heaven. He is everywhere and sees everywhere. Where he is, there is not heaven or stars or anything corporeal. The masters of the earth rule in an Egyptian city to the west. The Creator rules in the place between heaven and earth. He is called Zeus, which means life. Plutonian Zeus is lord over earth and sea, but he does not possess the sustenance for all mortal living creatures, for Kor is the one who produces crops. These forces are always powerful around the earth, but other forces are always from the one who is. The masters of the earth will withdraw and establish themselves in a city that is in a corner of Egypt, and that will be built toward the setting of the sun. Everybody will enter the city, whether they come by sea or by land. Trismegistus, where will they settle then? Asclepius, they will be in the great city that is on the Libyan mountain. Death frightens as a great evil because of ignorance of the topic. Death is the dissolution of the labors of the body and the number of the body when death completes the number of the body. For the number is what joins the body together. The body dies when it cannot support a person. And this is death, the dissolution of the body and the loss of bodily sensation. There is no need to be afraid of this or because of this. People are afraid because of what they do not know and do not believe. The Great Demon Judges Human Souls What is it they do not know or believe? Listen, Asclepius. There is a great demon that the Supreme God has appointed as overseer or judge of human souls. God has placed him in the middle of the air between earth and heaven. When a soul comes from a body, it must meet this demon. At once, the demon will turn this person around and examine him with regard to the character he developed during his lifetime. If the demon finds that the person accomplished all his deeds in a godly manner, deeds for which he came into the world, the demon will let him, turn him. But if the demon observes and becomes angry at a person who spent his life doing evil deeds, he grabs him on his way up and throws him back down so that he is suspended between heaven and earth and punished severely. There will be no hope for such a soul, and it will be in great pain. The Wicked will be punished. That soul does not have a place on earth or in heaven, but it has come to be in the open air of the universe, where there is blazing fire, freezing water, streams of fire, and massive turbulence. The bodies are tormented in various ways. Sometimes they are cast into raging water. At other times they are thrown down into fire in order that the fire may destroy them. I am not saying that this is the death of the soul, 
for the soul has been delivered from evil. Nonetheless, it is a death sentence. Asclepius, we must believe these things and fear them so that they may not happen to us. Unbelievers are impious and commit sin. Later, they will be made to believe, but they will not simply listen to words. They will experience the reality of these things, for they were convinced they would not have to go through them. Not only. First of all, Asclepius, all those who are earthly are subject to death, and those who are corporeal to loss, evil with such as these. For those here are not like those here, as the demons, people they despise, there. So it is not the same, but in truth the gods in that place will always punish more severely whoever has concealed something here. Trismegistus, of what sort is the wickedness in them? Asclepius, you think that when someone steals from a temple, the person is impious, for that kind of person is a thief and a robber. This is a matter between gods and people, but do not compare what happens here with what happens in the other place. I would like to speak this discourse to you confidentially. People will believe none of it. The souls that are full of much that is evil will not come and go in the air, but they will be situated in the places of demons, places full of pain and forever full of blood and slaughter, and their food is weeping, mourning, and groaning. Who are the demons? Trismegistus, who are the demons? Asclepius, some are called stranglers. Some roll souls downhill, some whip them, some throw them into the water, some throw them into the fire, some bring about the pains and afflictions of people. For those who are like this are not from a divine soul, nor from a rational human soul, but they are from terrible evil.